This is Shirley Jackson, writer of unsettling stories and self-proclaimed practicing amateur witch. You might be familiar with her from the Netflix series The Haunting of Hill House, which takes its title and general haunted house premise from her novel of the same name, and which utterly distressed and petrified me, so much so that I had to have significant month-long breaks between episodes. You might have watched Elizabeth Moss portray her in the 2020 biopic Shirley. You might have read this, her fantastic, dark, magical novel We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Or perhaps you know her from this, The Lottery and Other Stories. This is, as you might have guessed, a collection of short stories, and of these stories, this one, The Lottery, is probably the one you've heard of. It's a very unsettling tale about a disturbing and largely unquestioned tradition upheld by a small, close-knit community. But is it the most unsettling story in the collection? I'm going to give you a lowdown of the lottery before delving into a different story from this book. The one that left me more startled and disturbed than I've been in quite some time. Before we get into that, hi, welcome to the video. If you're new here, I'm Dr. Rosie Whitcomb and this lovely creature is Mouse the Cat, and we make videos on all things literary, so please subscribe if that's your jam. So, the lottery. The publication of this disturbing short story in The New Yorker in 1948 caused somewhat of an outcry. According to Jackson's biographer, Ruth Franklin, Jackson received letters for the rest of her life that demanded an explanation for the lottery. What was this story about? What did it mean? Why did it leave me feeling icky? People wrote to The New Yorker expressing their disgust and displeasure, and some even cancelled their subscriptions. According to Jackson, one disgruntled reader wrote in and said, Never has it been my lot to read so cunningly vicious a story as that published in your last issue for June. I tremble to think of the fate of American letters if that piece indicated the taste of the editors of a magazine I had considered distinguished. While Jackson suffered some abuse for the lottery, most people, according to Franklin, seemed just to be confused by it. They didn't know whether it was a piece of fiction or a report of actual events. In an article about the public response to the lottery, Jackson described getting hundreds of letters from people, many of whom wanted to know where these lotteries were held and whether they could go there and watch. Whether they understood the lottery to be fiction or not, whether they thought it cunningly vicious and inappropriate or not, the story certainly struck a chord with the reading public, horrified and fascinated in equal part. Now, it's readily considered an American classic. It's very well studied and very well known, but what's the big deal? What is it actually about? The Lottery is a disturbing account of an ages-old tradition in a New England village. This tradition is referred to as the Lottery, it's compulsory for all villages, it works in two stages, and it essentially goes something like this. Stage one, you arrive at a gathering in the village square. Everybody's there, your family, all your neighbours. This gathering facilitates the Lottery and is being managed, chaired if you will, by one man, Mr Summers, who has a box filled with pieces of folded up paper. Let's say you're the head of your family. You, alongside all the other men in your position, step forward and pick a piece of paper at random. Now, not all households are headed by men, but most of them are. Of all these pieces of paper, one of them is marked with a black spot. You take yours and unfold it. If it's blank, great! If it's marked, then you progress to the next stage. Stage two, you're invited forward to choose another bit of folded up paper, but this time your family accompanies you and you each choose a piece of paper. And again, one of them will be marked with a black spot. If yours is blank, great. If it's marked, you're publicly stoned by the rest of the villagers. To death? We don't know. After Mrs. Hutchinson reveals her marked piece of paper, Jackson ends the story with the chilling line, it isn't fair, it isn't right. Mrs. Hutchinson screamed, and then they were upon her. We're left to speculate, to sit in this uncomfortable reality in which Mrs. Hutchinson might have suffered a brutal death. And we have to sit with the fact that this is something that happens, we're told, on a yearly basis. More than this, the lottery isn't exclusive to this village, and we don't know exactly how widespread a custom it is. Now, there are murmurs of other villages nearby ending the practice, but the elders in this village dismiss that as nonsense. They do say, Mr. Adams said to Old Man Warner, who stood next to him, that over in the North Village, they're talking of giving up the lottery. Old Man Warner snorted. <laughs> Pack of crazy fools, he said, listening to the young folks. Nothing's good enough for them. Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to go back to living in caves. Nobody work anymore. Live that way for a while. Used to be a saying about lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. First thing you know, we'd all be eating stewed chickweed and acorns. 
There's always been a lottery, he added petulantly. So first up, we can see that superstition plays a significant part in the story. The lottery is, in essence, a ritual sacrifice. You never find out why the villagers insist on running the lottery each year, but you learn about these rumours and odd beliefs like stone someone to death and you'll have a good harvest that have no logical explanation. Another unsettling thing about the story is that, it would appear, every villager partakes in the stoning, including, we can assume, the family members of the person who wins the lottery. This year, the unfortunate lot falls to Mrs Tessie Hutchinson. Now, it's worth remembering that in stage two, each member of the Hutchinson family has to choose a paper, including a child so young they need an adult to help them choose and unfold their paper. This is dark on many levels, not least that it implies the bigger your family, the less chance you have of being chosen. Fit into the nuclear family culture, you're less likely to be stoned by your community. Live alone, have few family ties and choose not to have children. If you choose the black spot in stage one, there won't be a stage two. The Hutchinsons, though, don't have this problem. They're a pretty big family, two parents and three kids take part. But the way they react to the situation is no less dark and disturbing. Poor Tessie. It's creepy how her husband and children react when they aren't chosen, when they open their papers and find them blank. When her two older children discover they're safe, they beamed and laughed, turning around to the crowd and holding their slips of paper above their heads. They play to the crowd and delight in their look, showing no sorrow or distress over the fact that it's going to be one of their parents, Bill or Tessie, who will have the black spot. It's a great story and one that leaves this heaviness in my heart because it's so short and so sadistic and such a fascinating commentary on mob culture and the perils of tradition. These are ordinary people, like you and me, talking as they stand waiting about in the crowd about getting back to work or doing the washing up or raising their families. They're not detached loony cultists. They're our friends, our neighbours. They're us. It's very interesting to me that so many of the people who wrote into The New Yorker and to Jackson expressed, above all, confusion over what the story meant. And I wonder what that says about 1940s America and the kind of demographic that was reading The New Yorker at that time. Franklin offers the following take. The lottery anticipates the way we would come to understand the 20th century's unique lessons about the capacity of ordinary citizens to do evil. From the Nazi camp bureaucracy to the communist societies that depended on the betrayal of neighbour by neighbour. In 1948, with the fresh horrors of the Second World War barely receding into memory and the Red Scare just beginning, it's no wonder that the story's first readers reacted so vehemently to this ugly glimpse of their own faces in the mirror, even if they did not realise exactly what they were looking at. I find that so fascinating. And it's a reminder to me of how easy it is to forget about historical context when reading a text from my own contemporary perspective. Like, part of me sitting here thinking, how is the message not obvious? But it wasn't obvious to a lot of people and is still the subject of debate. And this is one thing I adore about studying literature, the variety of different interpretations and how wildly those interpretations can change depending on history, circumstance and context. What do you think? Do you agree that the lottery is a commentary on the dangers of tradition? Or do you have a completely different interpretation? Let me know in the comments. One final thing I want to mention about the lottery. It's an interesting take on witches and witch trials of days gone by. And it's apt that the punishment falls to Tessie, Mrs Hutchinson, an older woman, the demographic more likely to be tortured and murdered for being witches back in the day. You get a sense of the ageism involved when Nancy Hutchinson, Tessie's 12-year-old daughter, chooses her piece of paper. The crowd was quiet. A girl whispered, I hope it's not Nancy. And the sound of the whisper reached the edges of the crowd. Everybody hears this. No one contradicts it. This sense of hoping it's not one person suggests that by default you kind of hope it's one of the others, which is uncomfortable enough. But there's also this grim undercurrent that of the mother and daughter, nobody really cares too much about the mother. She's portrayed as a bit outspoken, maybe a bit of a nag earlier in the story, which again plays back into the witchcraft theme and the stories you hear of old, undesirable women with opinions being called witch to shut them up. What makes you think she is a witch? Oh, she turned me into a newt! A newt? We got better. The lottery is up to its elbows in witchery, but so too is an even shorter and, in my opinion, even more disturbing story from the collection, simply and aptly titled the witch. Even if you've heard of all of these, and better yet, if you've read them, you're still less likely to have come across the witch. 
In this edition, it spans only five pages. It can literally get lost if you flip through too quickly. And this almost adds to its unsettling, uncanny tenor. It's there, lurking. And if you're not careful, you might just miss it. The coach was so nearly empty that the little boy had a seat all to himself. And his mother sat across the aisle on the seat next to the little boy's sister, a baby, with a piece of toast in one hand and a rattle in the other. So the story begins. The little boy, introduced to us here, is at that age where he's asking lots of questions and commenting excitedly on everything they pass as the train shunts along. His mother is reading quietly, tending to the baby every now and then, and answering his questions without looking up. There's a cow, he would say, or sighing, how far do we have to go? Not much longer now, his mother said each time. The little boy goes to soothe his baby sister as she starts to cry, and his mother gives him a lollipop. He returns to his window, looks out and says, I saw a witch. There was a big, old, ugly witch outside and I told her to go away and she went away, the little boy went on in a quiet narrative to himself. She came and said, I'm going to eat you up. And I said, no, you're not. And I chased her away, the bald, old, mean witch. Then into the carriage comes a man, an elderly man with a pleasant face under white hair. He says hello to the little boy and they strike up a pleasant conversation. The man asks the boy what he's looking at out the window. The boy tells him, witches. The man asks how old the boy is. The boy says, 26, 840, 80. His mother looks up from her book. Four, she said, smiling fondly at the little boy. This kind of playful question and answer continues. The little boy says, that's my sister over there. Referencing, of course, his baby sister. And then we get this. Do you love your sister? The man asked. The little boy stared, and the man came around the side of the seat and sat down next to the little boy. Listen, the man said, shall I tell you about my little sister? The mother, who had looked up anxiously when the man sat down next to her child, goes peacefully back to her book. Tell me about your sister, the little boy said. Was she a witch? Maybe, the man said. Once upon a time, he began, I had a little sister just like yours. The little boy looked up at the man, nodding at every word. My little sister, the man went on, was so pretty and so nice that I loved her more than anything else in the world. So shall I tell you what I did? The little boy nodded more vehemently and the mother lifted her eyes from her book and smiled, listening. I bought her a rocking horse and a doll and a million lollipops, the man said. And then I took her and I put my hands around her neck and I pinched her and I pinched her until she was dead. The little boy gasped and the mother turned around, her smile fading. She opened her mouth and then closed it again as the man went on. And then I took her and I cut her head off and I took her head. Did you cut her all in pieces? The little boy asked breathlessly. I cut off her head and her hands and her feet and her hair and her nose, the man said, and I hit her with a stick and I killed her. <sighs> Who saw that coming? Let's just, let's take a breather there, shall we? I'd really love to know what you think of this exchange, what we might call the turning point of the story. For me, I remember when I first read it, it really took me aback. I wasn't expecting something so sudden and explicit and gruesome at all. It's an amazingly powerful shift, I think, done incredibly well, that's captivating and horrifying and leaves me feeling fully disturbed. And this is, I want to emphasize again, only a five page long short story. You know, it may be small, but it packs a punch. Let me know in the comments what you think. Did the old man's revelation catch you off guard? Could you see it coming? And if you want more content of this ilk, please subscribe and give this video a like. So where to begin in terms of analysis? Um, I mean, we've already touched on the suddenness of this revelation. It makes you sit up, sets you right on edge. What the f is this random man saying to this four-year-old child? We barely have time to conjecture whether he's telling the truth or wonder who he is. He just carries on with his tale in this uncomfortable, childlike manner. And note that, note the way he talks. It's very similar to how the little boy was talking at the beginning. I cut off her head and her hands and her feet and her hair and her nose, and I hit her with a stick and I killed her. Sort of semi-nonsensical stream of consciousness. And I did this and I did that, which in a child is endearing. But in this strange man who might have killed his baby sister is terrifying. The little boy's response too is alarming. He's captivated, not scared. What the man says almost fits seamlessly into the little boy's narrative of make-believe. 
So we've got this disturbing overlap between childlike imagination and the real potential of child torture, mutilation and murder. And this is another thing. The man doesn't just talk about how he killed his sister, but how he violated her body in the way he cut it up. Now, we might decide that this man is suffering from some form of mental illness, and none of this is true. After all, he says he kills his sister in three different ways, and only one of those can be true. But I don't think this story is really posing a question of truth. It's more a question of why is this man saying this, true or not, to a little boy? And what is the effect of that? The mother is shocked. Shocked enough she doesn't know how to respond at first, but then interjects as the man continues describing more and more grotesque scenarios. She stood next to the man and said, Just what do you think you're doing? The man looked up courteously and she said, Get out of here! Now, to me, this is a really creepy exchange because what she says to him, to this elderly man, buys in to the strange childlike persona he's adopted. You know, just what do you think you're doing, to my mind, is a phrase or a way of phrasing that kind of question that an adult wouldn't say to another adult. It's the way an adult would chastise a child. It's finger wagging. Though she's intervening, she's also sucked into this bizarre reality the man has created, fitting into the role of mother. And the man's response is equally disturbing. Did I frighten you? The man said. He looked down at the little boy and nudged him with an elbow, and he and the little boy laughed. This really speaks to me of how easily young children can be manipulated or groomed by adults. The little boy is on the man's side, it would seem. Not only is he not terrified, but he's formed a kinship with this man over his gruesome anecdotes. They've teamed up and turned against the mother as though she's the crazy one for being frightened and being frightened is laughable. I can very easily call the conductor, the mother said to the man. The conductor will eat my mummy, the little boy said. We'll chop her head off. And little sister's head too, the man said. The little boy is so enraptured. He's parroting the violent narrative. And again, it fits in with what he was saying earlier about the witch he saw out the window who threatened to eat him all up. Now, it's at this point that the man gets up and leaves politely, excusing himself, as he exits the train car, the little boy says, my mummy will eat you, and he and the man laugh together again. Now, this isn't a horror story that ends with the man coming back later and killing the mother or the little boy killing his sister. The ending is much more uncomfortable and much more nuanced than that. The ending of this story is awkward. It's stunned. It's not a call to action. You know, the mother doesn't go and tell the conductor and the boy doesn't start behaving violently. There's just this uncomfortable pause in which the mother is trying to work out the best thing to say. And she settles on, you sit still and be a good boy. You may have another lollipop. And like, yeah, what else can you say? What's the right thing to do here? Do you ask if he's okay? Do you tell him off for interacting with the man? Do you reassure him? It's unclear. And this makes the whole thing even more upsetting. The encounter has enforced a confounded silence on the mother. In any case, the boy is very excited to receive his second lollipop and thanks his mother before asking, did that man really cut his little sister up in pieces? The mother insists the man was just teasing and the boy accepts this, goes back to his seat and looks out the window. Probably he was a witch. The story closes. There's no resolution here. The man leaves, presumably free to terrorise other families. The mother doesn't know how to talk to her son about it. The little boy, true to form, seems to get over it quickly. He's stimulated by the thing in front of him, as children often are. But the fact he sort of brushes it off is unsettling in itself. It's almost like it didn't happen. We're left questioning the whole exchange. One question being, was the man, indeed, as the boy suggests, a witch? If, as we tend to assume, witches are women, this is an interesting gender role reversal. We have the witch figure described at the beginning of the story by the boy in the more traditional way, the bald old mean witch who is female. By the end, we're introduced to the possibility that an elderly man in a suit with a kind face is the real witch of the story. Like in the lottery, this role reversal serves to highlight the normalcy of violent action. The most brutal traditions, the most terrifying characters aren't dressed up as wicked witches. They're your neighbours, your friends, your family the nice old man who sits next to you on the train. In Jackson, any sense of normal, nice, polite suburbanity, that is a word, is ripped right out of the ground. There is no safety in normal. Everyone has the potential for evil. We never get any answers. 
We never see an end to the train journey. We never find out how much of what the man said, how much of what the boy saw out of the window is true. The story's simplistic structure and brevity mimics a child's bedtime story almost, and we get a strong sense of childlike narratives throughout, like when the man begins his anecdote with once upon a time. The story is so disturbing because it directly addresses and magnifies child murder and manipulation with no consequence for the murderer slash manipulator. We're left to reel in the myriad distressing possibilities Jackson presents to us with no clear means of resolution. But what do you think? Do you prefer the lottery? Or is there another Shirley Jackson short story or novel you think is more frightening? Let me know below. Shirley Jackson staked out a reputation for herself in the 20th century as a master of American Gothic fiction. If you want to learn about the master of English Gothic fiction in the 18th century, click here next.